Well, welcome back to history. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about extra credit as related to United States foreign affairs. And where does foreign affairs fit in? And what's the overview that we're going to give you? So this is sort of a deep dive. You're going to get these terms throughout, but you, to make that to make that extra connection and to really broaden your horizons, that's what this extra credit assignment is about. And remember, we teach by the dime here. We just redesigned the course simply because no one was getting to the present day. Imagine, parent, and some of your parents are over here as well as your students, imagine if you don't know your own history of the past 75 years. That is what's been happening now. And with the, the virus that we've got, this pandemic going on, we never get there. So it's not just mathematics that's get, get, gets really destroyed your knowledge of it. It's also the destruction of your knowledge of history. So one of the things that we did early on, which has allowed us to get a lot further than other other places that only teach social sciences, is we use the dime format, the diplomatic, political, the informational culture, the military and economic aspects of our nation. Well, today we're going to focus on the diplomatic, political. You get all these terms already, but I'm, I'm going to really right now, for you who are just desiring to really understand your government is related to foreign affairs, I'm going to knock it out for you here today. And it's great extra credit. Now, the first principle, or the first term we have is doctrine. Every doctrine comes from the executive branch. When a president <coughs> excuse me, gets elected, his team has to form a doctrine. What is it? It's a principle of law. A principle of law. Law that is applied, okay, or just used to guide foreign policy and military, I'm going to say just mill because I'm running out of room, okay, mill strategy. This is known to everyone in the country. This cannot be hidden. This can't not be classified. This cannot be secretive. This is your right to know what your foreign affairs doctrine is going to be. It's very important. Every president has it. And they have their personality and stamps on them too. They really do. Like for example, President Reagan wanted to win the Cold War. He told his national security team, we're going to win this without firing a shot. And he exactly did that. Well, how did he do it? He came up with a thing they call the Reagan doctrine. We're going to support free democratic countries not we're going to, and we're going to get away from supporting countries that have dictatorships that support us but hate communism because communism has its own dictatorship you got two dictatorships you know. so he says i want to get away from that and he announced it to the world to everybody and of course you can criticize it you have that right that freedom of expression so everyone does it uh the trump doctrine trump doctrine was very effective Again, and it, you can see the characteristics. We're going to do this, 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 and this. You, you know what it is, okay? The Obama doctrine definitely had that personality of Obama, who was, you know, who was somewhat nebulous, who was somewhat more uh, aloof in his thinking. And so you kind of you kind of had to really understand what he was saying, and the words sometimes felt like doublespeak, but that was just his nature, okay? And so these things do have the stamp of the personality of the person you elect. They often do, all right? And weak presidents, you can often see that they get overrun by their own administration. You, this is a really important leadership piece. So when you're in debates and all this other stuff before being elected president, pay attention to this. What are they actually saying? If it doesn't sound like they really know what they're doing, then that's a problem, okay? Now, doctrine drives foreign policy and military strategy. Well, what is policy. What's that? What's that word? Well, it's a principle, once again, a principle. Okay, so you see that word principle, a concept, all right, an American concept. Principle used to guide decisions <clears throat> in foreign and military strategy. Okay. Now you say, okay, boss, I got that. That makes sense. So the policies pertain specifically to a nation. 
or a region. Because you can have doctrine, but there's different ways of executing that based on the different situations. For example, if you look, I'm just going to use Reagan, okay, just throughout here. It's probably a little more helpful. So we know that Reagan wants to defeat the Soviet Union. He wants to get rid of let communism as a structure fall and be destroyed. And of course it was. He was very successful. Also, communism fell upon itself too, but boy, did he, he move along. He, he forced that. But the idea here is that foreign policy related to a region, a continent, a geog geographical region, a political or cultural region like the Middle East, for example, is going to be very different than, the, say, the policy in Southwest Asia. It's going to be, this, you're going to represent this, but you have a different policy and military strategy go along with that. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, now you're saying, okay, I got that. that, that's, that that's important. What about this law thing that I threw out at you earlier? Okay. So we go back, this is why I teach you guys the Constitution, not the world according to the DeRay or somebody else's opinion or some political opinion. This is the world according to the Founding Fathers. The established principles of the Constitution that are nearly mirrored are very close to principles of law. Popular sovereignty. The, the power of the people is separated from the government. Our ability to vote people in and out. And that mechanism is known as republicanism, to choose electors to represent us. It's two, though, right there. Limited government. The government is only supposed to have the powers given to it by the Constitution, nothing more. And yes, the people have the power to change the Constitution. Fourth one, federalism. Powers not given uh, to the federal government belong to individuals and states. And boy, you see the back and forth all the time. Okay? Separation of powers, three different branches, okay? executive, judicial, and legislative. The legislative has, has oversight over this because the president can't just authorize money to do whatever he wants. Congress has to authorize it, right? And, and you know, that's separation of powers. That's also checks and balances. All right? And then individual rights, which is so big here. Sometimes you hear them as human rights. Is there a difference between human rights and individual rights? There seems to be a much more, it's more than just nuanced. Nuanced means kind of a different shade. We're seeing human rights and individual rights almost be two separate things. In this country, we teach individual rights, but people are now starting to use that term human rights. So it's interesting how you look at these things, you kind of see those shades. But there's some separate definitions in there. We think of individual rights of the rights of the individual, regardless of who you are, based on those bill of rights. That's a immediate thing that we see. So in this country, you can see how different we are already with the world. So we're looking for people, that virtuous idea that you start to learn, manifest destiny. We don't need to take over a country, we just need to support people who believe in sort of the things that they want of ours, because we're prosperous, we're unique, okay? So we want that to happen, and policy is the way to do it. Now here's the deal, these two are typically known. This must be known, a lot of this should be known, unless there's some real big reason why we shouldn't know that, okay? But these two are should be known. What is not known is often classified, but it's also public in certain areas is strategy. And strategy is a misused term. Um, so and once, you, once you see what I write, and you'll see why some people just sort of throw that word out a lot. I hear that word in, here in, in education a lot. The strategies in the classroom. Well, let's take, before you get into that, you just throw that word out. Let's think what the definition is. And it's something you could use, too, when you're, you're looking at your financial strategy, your overview of where you want to go. This is a very good definition. And this definition comes not from DeRay. This definition comes from National Defense University, the U.S. Naval War, War College, the U.S. Army War College, the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, as well as the Air War College. So this is a widely accepted and also uh, in various uh, circles is as defined. Strategy is the way, I'll write that in, the way, could be ways, okay, we'll just say the way for it now, of achieving, okay, and end, could be ends, so we'll kind of put in parentheses here, if that's helpful, and end, okay, using Available means. And 
ends, ways, means. And available, I'm going to really asterisk that. Not what you dream up that you want, but what you got. This, this is why in life it's important in your academic career to have problem solving. When I run my mathematics classrooms, if I'm teaching you mathematics, you know it's a math gym. Because I want to get to the problem solving. I want to throw you loops in things. Because I want to see if you can understand the invariable means. I want you to see and understand the math. You're, can you correlate the available means that you have mathematically? And mathematics is the only thing. You got to look at it spiritually if, if that's what you're into. You got to also look at it from a perspective of physical means, resources, time, money, effort, you know, all those things that go into doing solving a problem, right? But in math class, man, I'm, I'm, I'm this is me. This is me all day long. Seeing if you can do prob. This is problem solving, folks. And it's ugly in government, and no one's going to agree. And it's sometimes when, when news media put things out in the year, and sometimes often a yellow journalistic way. It seems like our government isn't working very well, all right? And so people aren't working hard. And I get it. There are things that have been going on in our government that are absolutely wrong, just like there are things that go on in the public view that are absolutely wrong and immoral. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about disagreements and problem solving as it relates to this. So the ways of achieving and ends related to your doctrine and policy using available means. And available is, put it this way, you don't, we even use an old expression, you don't go to war with the army you want, you go to war with the army you got, okay? And that same plays to, to the Navy, to the diplomatic corps, to, to USAID, economic development, whatever you're doing that's supporting these things, all right? Hopefully that, that really helps you. Now, what's a policy that could be, because I know it's gonna come up, what's a policy that could be, What's a policy that could be more classified? In other words, we, we shouldn't really know it because it could harm individuals. Military assistance. Let's say a uh, policy where we're providing military assistance to the Afghan rebels in the 80s to fight the communists. That's what we were doing, okay? Well, do we need to know where the Stinger air defense missile systems are going? Someone needs to know, and they actually lost track of it later on, and that's, that was a problem. That's a big no-go. But should you and I know that? Probably not, because if we know that, we could, you know, by no fault of your own, simply by an honest mistake that may leak your lips. And someone may, who's an enemy of our country, and may do what? Send that information to the communists, all right? So certain things, yeah, like that, like military assistance information we shouldn't know about. But generally speaking, all this, we should know that we're providing military assistance. And then we should have a congressional committee, a House Intelligence Committee, that says this is, this is what we're doing. And we're supposed to trust those people to know. Now, if things get shaky, we don't know what's going on. This is when we have to separate ourselves between <coughs> good journalism and yellow journalism. Because sometimes journalists will do what? They'll shade something and, and create a lie that's not really true. That will create people to go, tell me what's going on here, and create distrust. So it... It's always difficult. You're going to really have to assess who you vote for <coughs> in regards to politics and what their true character is. Are they devious or are they a good person that's just maybe straightforward? You've got, you got to really figure that out. But either way, doctrine and policy are typically well known. Strategy, you're going to know a lot of it, but the, the actual means and the numbers and somehow what they're actually doing, you're not going to know. Now, what do you typically not know that are subcomponents that drive this down? Here's the things that you don't know. Typically, you've got to plan. We talk about plans like an operational plan or a contingency plan. Something that when something happens and you see intelligence things working somewhere, that you're going to do an economic plan or something else, an embargo, something like that. Strategy is part of an embargo, okay? You know, the Navy has a presence. You just saw probably just a few days ago, Iran launched ballistic missiles against coalition and U.S. forces in Iraq. Um, you know, obviously, that's violent. You know, well, we, the USS Nimitz did what? The carrier battle group was heading back, and it turned immediately around and headed, into, into the, headed towards the Mediterranean. So you know certain things, but do you know the actual way the Nimitz, if it had to, or what it is currently doing, its tactics, techniques, and procedures? You don't know that 
we shouldn't know that, all right? And we, we, we don't want the enemy to know that, okay? But the enemy does know this because we're a free world, all right? And you're probably saying, that's not a good idea. Well, I'll tell you, when the Reagan doctrine came out, it struck fear into the communist world. And that fear contributed to them just co completely collapsing. You know, if, if you stand up on your own two feet and you tell people this is what I believe in, you know, it, it, they don't like you, all right? They don't like you. It drives fear. But what you don't do is the details of it. Hopefully that helps out. Now, what's a plan? A plan is this, all right? <clears throat> a plan is simply, when we get into a plan, it's simply a, okay, a uh, idea or concept involving diplomatic or military means to support a strategy, a direct strategy. Sometimes you don't know this. Let me just expand on the, on the Stinger missiles. When the Stinger missiles went missing, the CIA was, uh, was giving, you know, to get freedom of information. I'm, I'm telling you any secrets here. After the Afghan rebels, long ago in the 80s, fought the communists, um, we gave them Stinger missiles, and we completely destroyed it. This is what's not known. A thousand Stinger missiles were sent, I think it was Type 1 infrared heat seekers, was sent to, through the CIA, with CIA people training the Afghan rebels, to defeat the communists that the Soviets had overran their country. Out of the 1,000, approximately, I believe it was 600 or 800 were used, okay? Which, I forget the number. I know it was, they had that accountability number. I forget whether it was 600 or 800. The Stinger missiles had absolute, oh, it was 800, okay? And the Stinger missiles had, you know how effective these things are, had destroyed and obliterated the Soviet Air Force. They shot down 679 aircraft, because the CIA kept, kept numbers on it. Later, this was made freedom of information, was made public. Think about that. Imagine 679 aircraft destroyed. I mean, it brought the Soviet Air Force to its knees. It couldn't keep up. And it's not just in Afghanistan, overall, they couldn't train pilots fast enough, because pilots were also being killed. Not all of them in those events. You know, maybe they, they bailed out uh, by parachute. But you can imagine the vast destruction of the Communist Air Force at that time, including the helicopters, the MI-24 Heinz and the MI-8 HIP helicopters. So you have 800 missiles are used. Now you're saying, okay, Duran, I'm paying attention to what you're saying. So you're telling me about 200 of them are unaccounted for. That's correct. And there was a belief that these, some of these missiles, you know, a solid rocket propeller has a shelf life of just like anything else. I don't think I could tell you that, so I'm not going to. But how's the shelf life? It degrades and then falls apart and it becomes useless. But there's still good technology in that Stinger missile that you don't want to get in the right hands. So the Stinger missiles, there was an idea in Libya when Libya was forced to, you know, the Obama doctrine wasn't, you know, it was, it was hard to figure out why they're going against Libya, but it did occur. But now that they're on the ground, they're trying to figure out where all these Stinger missiles are at because they had an understanding intelligence reports the Stinger missiles lined up in Libya. And if you remember the movie uh, that revolved about the Benghazi debacle where the ambassador was killed during the, uh, Obama's administrative time and all the stuff that happened, when the ambassador was killed, there was a story that prior to that, one of the things that the contractors were doing, private contractors that are being paid by our government, one of the things they were involved in was trying to find if there are any Stinger missiles left over and that these people had them, rebel groups had them, to get someone, get, to keep cleaning it up, keep accountability. So that's a plan. That was not really well known. It was executed, it was very quiet. It was run by private contractors. They were sworn to secrecy, obviously. Of course, this all came out uh, because of the Benghazi incident where the ambassador was killed, um, overrun by Islamic terrorists there in Libya. And if you haven't had that story, you'll see that at the beginning. That was one of the things they were trying to do. So sometimes you don't know that plan, okay? Sometimes you don't know that plan. Sometimes you do know, but you don't know the details. So this will always go back and forth of what we should and should not know, right? Now the next one is an operation, okay, that supports these
concepts, foreign affairs concepts. Next is an operation. An operation is an activity or mission, all right, mission, okay, to achieve a specific objective or objectives. Okay. So these are goal oriented, but these get to be specific objectives. Let's take for example, and sometimes, you, well, a lot of times you will not know the details of these, and sometimes these are completely and totally classified. Other times you know it. You know what's up happening. For example, Operation Iraqi Freedom. That was a name given to invade Iraq. And then later on, after that objective was achieved, or the objectives were achieved, they said, and we're still here, well, if we need, what's the new operation? And there, it has to go through an evaluation process. And of course, Operation New Dawn, Operation Farad al Kunun, all right, in Farsi, so in Arabic, all right. So, the, so these missions, even though you're still there, now change. They have a different what? Change to them. So I want you to understand that a lot of this could be classified, a lot of this could be unclassified, a lot of this should be known. But you may, you're probably, what's definitely is going to be classified is the details of how it's going about. Why is that? Because it could do what? Expose what we're doing to the enemy. So whereas the enemy would know this, we're telling them up front, right in their face, this is, if you're an enemy of us, this is what we're doing. Some of this might be a little hidden. Okay. But in some of these things you're going to know about, and these, the, you know, the big pieces you'll know about, like, for example, um, during the Cold War, Reagan Doctrine, the strategy was to go from a 479-ship Navy to a 525-ship Navy. That was an open debate. But how the Navy would use those ships, okay, the technology behind them, okay, that's going to be, remain classified. Hopefully this gives you an idea of our foreign affairs overview, how doctrine, policy, strategy, plans, and operations link together. And again, remember what I said, presidents will have their flavor. So when you look at somebody, a president of the United States, or someone who wants to run for president, you have to judge their character because they will have an influence. Are, are they a wet noodle? Are they strong? Um, do they say things literally, okay, that you know is not true, but you should take them seriously? That's a quote that people said of uh, uh, President Trump. Never take him literally, but take him seriously. Okay, we'll see you on the high ground.